Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Brianne Roth. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Nantucket Historical Association. And I want to welcome you all to another installment of our Fall 2016 Food for Thought series. Before we get things started today, if everyone could please check your cell phones to ensure they're silent um, so we don't disrupt today's um, lecture. As always, we um, would like to thank you for joining us, and we would like to thank the um, MS Worthington Foundation and Novation Media for their media sponsorship. This afternoon's lecture will be followed by a short Q&A, so if you have any questions, um, we'll open up the floor for discussion after the lecture. And on a bit of a background for today's speaker, um, Kathleen Minahan founded Mini Nutrition to share the importance of healthy living and to illustrate that health and nutritional change can be enjoyable and achievable. A registered dietitian nutritionist with a master's in nutrition and health promotion from Simmons College, Minahan models a non-diet approach to a healthier life. Through her own personal practice, Kathleen accepts that health, much like life, is ever-changing and adapting healthy habits is the key to securing a happy life. Please give a round of applause to Kathleen Minahan. So my name is Kathleen Minahan, and I recognize many of you as small Nantucket was helpful with. So um, as Brie men mentioned, I got my master's in nutrition and health promotion from Simmons College. And from there, I went on to um, Hunter College, and I did my internship, my dietetic internship at um, Beth Israel Hospital in New York, um, Kohler Goldwater Hospital, as well as Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, for the past five years, I was the farm to school manager for Sustainable Nantucket, and and um, with that program, I was able to work with students and families to really allow them to embrace a healthier lifestyle using exploratory learning um, through growing food, cooking, and eating food to help them kind of introduce healthy living through osmosis in a fun and active environment. Um, since then, I've moved on. I work part-time as a dietitian at the Nantucket Cottage Hospital. I see both outpatients and inpatients there, and I work a little bit um, in the dialysis unit as well. Um, and so today, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, kind of my business and my approach to things. Um, and so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer at the end. Um, but if anything's confusing in the moment, just kind of raise your hand and I can maybe clarify things a little bit. Um, so I began Minahan Nutrition, to, or Mini Nutrition, sorry. I recently shortened it. Um, um, as a way to encourage embracing small, sustainable changes. Um, I really wanted to help to spread the message that health is so much more than weight. Um, with ob the, the obesity epidemic, epidemic, there has been a huge emphasis pa um, placed on normal weight um, that it is often being conflated with um, dieting and health, or which is causing health to be conflated with dieting, um, which is not the case. Um, I constantly see people beating themselves up, trying to reach this normal weight, whatever that is, um, and there really still is no clear definition of normal weight, so I hate saying that. Um, um, but I've seen people beat themselves up trying to uh, achieve this normal um, by diving into extreme workouts and excessive um, depletion of calories um, to a point that food is no longer enjoyable. And if I can get anything across today, that food and exercise should be uh, enjoyable. It's just taking the time to figure out what works best for you. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about how to accomplish that today. Um, so there's just so much information provided on what we should change, and we really don't focus at all on how to incorporate that into our lifestyle. You know, there's a million and one diets out there, but we never really talk about the behavior or the thought process behind it, and that is really key and important. Um, so it's really my goal to help get the message across and to guide um, the community around me to realize that happiness and enjoy enjoyment are paramount in health and moving forward and creating these changes. 
Um, so I base my practice around three core principles because I don't think that any one of them can exist on their own. Yes, a healthy diet, um, food is important, but there's also an importance between a balance in everyday, regular exercise. It doesn't have to be CrossFit. It doesn't have to be yoga. It can just be an easy walk on the beach or whatnot, but constant movement, as well as self-care. And self-care is really uh, making sure that you are taking the time to appreciate yourself and not beating yourself up and moving forward. Um, so that's kind of where that enjoyment piece comes in. And if you're eating well most of the time, participating in regular activity and enjoying the process, then I find that you are being successful. And it's important to take a step back and realize that. Um, and just to remember, it's not all about the numbers, but really about how you feel. Oftentimes, we set off on a goal, um, and even before we reach there, we might feel confident, comfortable, and the numbers are showing that we're healthy, but we're still trying to attain this number that we set off on this journey with. Um, so today, I'm going to talk a little bit about why nutrition is important, but also to um, get you to think a little bit about pr approaching diet and lifestyle change from a different path than you might have before. All right. So I do want to stress the importance of nutrition first because I'm going to be talking a lot about liberalizing your approach to diet and healthy eating, and I don't want the importance of food to get lost um, because I do think healthy and nutritious eating is important but um, the weight and levity that we put on it is, I think, a bit extreme. Um, so why is nutrition important? Um, so the foods that you eat in the proper proportion can help you reach and maintain your body's fullest potential. The foods that we eat affect our memory, our skin, our hair, our hormones, our skeletal system, our sleep patterns, you name it. The list goes on and on. Um, kind of to think about it in another way, you are what you eat, but not in the way that we normally think it is. But really, you eat food, it gets broken down into all these little parts that you either use for energy or for building blocks to repair muscles, repair the cells in your body, um, and to grow and thrive. So when you are ingesting foods that might have um, artificial colors and chemicals in there, you're introducing um, foreign bodies into, into your body that your body doesn't know where to put them and how to place that. And so down the line, it can cause long-term problems. Um, the same thing goes with an imbalance of food. Um, I find, I'm sure many of you can agree with me, Americans go in extreme. So if we say flaxseed oil is healthy, we go um, you know, full throttle and are taking pills and pills of flaxseed, but really it's all about balance. Um, and thinking about that, if you have too much carbohydrate and not enough protein or fat, that can actually increase your risk for cardiovascular disease by increasing your um, cholesterol and things like that. And it's just things that we don't necessarily think about too much. Um. So simply with dietary change, we can cause um, significant changes in our body with the, within the absence of weight loss. Um, so for example, if you were to drink a 20 ounce soda every single day, if we just took that soda out and replaced it with whole foods, and I'm talking about any food that hasn't been touched, like even a peanut to peanut butter, so that's any whole food. Um, Studies have shown that your life is expected, expectant, why can't I say that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Can <laughs> increase by almost five years. Um, on the other, on another factor too, um, those small changes can cause, you know, a slight um, decrease in weight, but a li um, weight loss as little as 8% can cause significant health improvement and health changes, such as reduced risk for cardiovascular disease, lowers your blood pressure, lowers your blood sugar level if you do have um, diabetes or, pre or you're pre-diabetic, and can also in 
improve your lipid or cholesterol levels. So it's important that to make sure that the changes that you're making now are going to stick around and that they're going to benefit us more and harm us less. All right. So part of getting healthy is we have to make a change. So here's my fun little doodle. Um, have, have you heard of the stages of change in your life? No, okay. So there's stages of change. You have the pre-contemplation. You're like, oh, you know, maybe I know that eating salad's good for me. I, that's kind of, you know it's there. Maybe, maybe I will start to add it into my life. The contemplation, how am I going to do that? Then you start to prepare. Okay, so I'm going to buy my salad and my lettuce from the, the um, grocery store, and then I'm going to make it. And then you start increasing... Then you go to, from pre-contemplation, contemplation, you prepare, then you do the action, and then important to maintain it. But it's important to know that at any point in that stage of change, you can have a relapse. And what we tend, what I have seen and I have done myself is you always start off, and this is my fun little graphic I doodled here, we always think, okay, I'm at point A and I want to get to point B. I know what I have to do, easy as pie. I'm going to get from point A to point B in no time flat if I just do these things and get there. But what happens typically is life will get in the way and you kind of hit, oh, I didn't get enough sleep. I'm too tired. I'm not going to prepare. I didn't have enough time to get to the grocery store. You hit some roadblock that derails this nice smooth line and people start kind of beating themselves down, that they're a failure, they tend to give up and come kind of taking that long spiral back down. So it's important to, if you hit that bump, to kind of take pause, figure out why you've hit that bump, and figure out a way to just pick yourself up and move forward. So I like to use the marathon example. If you were to set out to run a marathon and you tripped and fell in a marathon, what are you going to do? Get up and go. You're not going to lay there until the marathon <laughs> starts up again next year, right? It's the same thing with lifestyle change. You really need to kind of keep up, keep moving, and figure out what those roadblocks are. If you trip because your shoelace was untied, you're going to tie your shoelace. It's the same concept with making dietary and lifestyle changes. Um, so change is difficult. Um, and you, however old you are is how long it's taken you to create the habits that you have now. It's not going to happen overnight. If you're learning how to ride a bike, you fall, you're not going to give up and say, I'm a failure at riding a bike, I'm never going to do it. You're going to get back up and kind of keep moving. And it's the same thing. If you're trying to eat healthier and you see that brownie, you know you shouldn't eat the brownie, but you eat the brownie anyway, you're not going to tell yourself you're a bad person because you ate the brownie and you're a failure. Just go move on to the next piece, have lots of fruits and vegetables for the rest of the day, and you'll be fine. Um, let's see. Yeah, and don't take everything on all at once. Um, you know, New Year's resolution time, I see a lot. Um, I'm joining a gym. I'm only eating lettuce and chicken breasts and sweet potatoes. And it lasts, it's too much. It's, if you go from being a couch potato and you only ever walk from your car from your home to your car and your car to your desk and your desk to your car, you know, going to the gym seven days a week and really restricting the foods that you typically don't like is setting yourself up for failure. So pick one piece, like maybe start with just the exercise. Do that for three days a week and then start to build in some of the other changes. And that's why I'm here to help you figure out what to start with, just to clarify. You don't have to figure that out. I know this is all abstract. Um, so yeah, it, it is empowering yourself with, with small changes. I, um, for example, um, I, was, I swam um, in college 
And after college, I then became a spin instructor. I injured myself and then kind of cut myself out from exercise. And there was probably a year and a half that I didn't exercise at all. I kept trying to do something. I would sign up for gym, go five days a week. And I then probably two days, two weeks later, I would give up. And so I cut it back. And I was like, okay, I'm only going to walk twice a week. And then that failed, so I cut it back to even one day. But now I've slowly rebuilt myself to where I am back at a place to where I feel that I am confident because I made these smaller goals. And it's just important to kind of make those shifts. Sorry, I'm blabbering a little bit. All right, so weight loss, I think, is mostly what I work with people on. Um, so I, yeah, I thought this was funny because just for, you know, the, these goal weights are so hypothetical and, you know, I work with um, people all the time that says I should be this weight and, um, you know, just like your height, your weight is predetermined to an extent, you know, some of us are going to be a little bit heavier even if we're the same height as someone else. No body is the same. So it's really important to kind of take note in how you feel rather than focusing on what a number is. If you, in your adult life, have never been 120 pounds, it's probably not realistic to say that that's your goal weight. I understand the kind of that drive to want to get there, but find maybe a place that your body wants to be at and that you feel comfortable living in that way as. So, um, let's see. So I think people feel that they have a lot of control over their diet. So if I told you to sit here and hold your breath, and told you, you have the willpower, all the willpower in the world, you can do it, hold your breath indefinitely, at some point your body is going to kick in and force you to breathe big deep breaths because it doesn't want you to die. It's the same thing with food. If you over restrict, your body at some point is gonna start sending these hormonal, hormonal and neurotransmitter signals telling you to take deep bites of food. And it's going to send you to sugar because that's how you can get energy the quickest and it's going to send you to fat because that is the food source that has the most calorie per um, gram. So you do have some control over the foods you eat, but if you are starting to over restrict, your body has um, a set of checks and balances to make sure that you aren't starving because our body is still kind of in that uh, evolutionary pattern. It doesn't understand that we have an obesity ep epidemic. It doesn't understand that we have all these fast foods everywhere anymore. Um, so let's see. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a set point theory because I think that it helps you, helps to understand a little bit about how weight loss works. Um, so, as I said, your body, just like your height, your weight is, um, you, you have a predetermined weight just like your height. Um, so as you eat a little bit of extra, you get a sick kind of full feeling which tells your body to stop eating. So that's one checkpoint. And actually your body, for a moment, will increase its metabolism to um, kind of burn off that extra fuel. If you kind of take it above and beyond that sick feeling, then that's when you start to store your food as fat. And the reverse, if you start to overly restrict calories, your, um, let's see, your body, your metabolism's gonna slow down, it's gonna learn to use those calories more efficiently and, so that you are still able to do everyday functions on lower fuel. So it's important to try and find a balance between too much and too little. So when you 
Um, so ideally what you want to try and do is have a deficit somewhere between 200 to 500 calories, um, 250 to 500 calories a day off of what you typically should need so that you're not sending your body into that feeling of starvation, which can then trigger you to go for the sugar and fat. Um, then you have this 10% theory. So once your body gets down 10, about 10% 10 weight loss, your body is going to be like, hold on, we're consistently losing weight and your fat cells are going to send out these signals that we're depleting and it's going to also trigger your metabolism to slow down a little bit. Um, so that's kind of that plateau fe feeling that a lot of times you get. And so what it is is sometimes it's okay to just hang out at normal. Just hang out and let your body readjust to where you're at. Let these signals calm down a little bit and then you can kind of dip back down and start depleting the calories again to move forward. Um, on the other hand, to kind of keep that calorie count up and moving, sorry, am I, is, am I making things clear? I think I'm jumping around a little bit. Okay. Another aspect to weight loss is, and keeping your metabolism up, is regular exercise and increased muscle mass. So when you lose um, a pound, about on a perfect um, rate of weight loss, so slow weight loss, 20% of that is going to come from muscle, the rest is going to come from fat. As you start to lose weight faster, the muscle to fat ratio is going to switch because it actually costs your body energy to maintain muscle and it costs your body nothing to maintain fat. It's going to start to expel the muscle faster because it doesn't want to feed this fuel, this, this muscle that it wants to um, maintain that energy to be able to keep your brain functioning, your heart pumping, things like that. So that faster weight gain can almost slow down your metabolism because you're pulling out some of that fat muscle and also because you're trying to learn to use those calories more efficiently because um, your body thinks it's going into starvation mode a little bit. So by constantly doing weight-bearing activity as you're losing weight, you're letting your body know that it needs those muscles as a function and you're maintaining that um, muscle integrity as you move forward. Um, so really... What I'm trying to get to with this is that slow and steady wins the race with weight loss. So maintaining exercise is important, but also just try not to get ahead of yourself. Um, if you consistently um, cut back the calories at a moderate amount to where you're not feeling that you're starving all the time, you'll, you will have kind of a longer run and you'll feel more in control of your um, hunger and satiety cues. Does anybody have any questions about that? All right. So, probably want to know what to eat a little bit. Um, I really say it's important to eat a balanced diet. Um, and that means that it's okay to also eat foods that aren't always considered healthy. Um, you do have to enjoy the foods that you're eating to allow for long term dietary change to work. Um, and we tend to label foods as good or bad and place significant moral weight on their value. Um, so I know a moment ago I said there are, you know, foods, bad foods can affect, they are what you eat a little bit, but eating a brownie isn't going to be the tipping point that's going to have you, you know, eating a brownie every once in a while isn't going to be the tipping point that's going to cause you to have diabetes tomorrow. So keep that balance into effect because you know, once again, you really do have to enjoy the food that you're eating to make your changes work. Um, so the more that you can accept a no food as a sometimes food, the less control you're giving over the food that might trigger it to derail kind of the momentum that you have. And you're, it will allow you to liberalize the way that you eat a bit more. Um, you know, I'm working kind of on this a little bit as well as 
it's really easy to feel guilty for sometimes eating a piece of candy or a brownie. If you ever see me at the Stop and Shop and I'm trying to get over this, but you know those two-tiered shopping carts, I always put my ice cream and my chips on the bottom cart so no one can see it and no one blames me for being a, di a bad dietitian. But, <laughs> you know, everyone has to go from somewhere. So how I really dislike counting calories and measuring out food and weighing things and keeping a log or a journal. And I have found that my patients and my clients really don't like that either. So if you can just look at your day um, as kind of a plate or even look at each meal rather than a hypothetical. But if you make half of your plate fruits and vegetables, you're probably you are doing better than most of this country. It's really simple. Um, and you don't, and ideally you want it to be a variety of color. If you can get two different colors into your, onto your plate in a day, that's a pretty good first step. Um, you know, go with a red cabbage and broccoli and an apple. Um, you know, that's three different colors right there. Um, then the other you know, portion up at the top is whole grains and starchy vegetables for me. So that would be potatoes, um, beets, um, winter squash, brown rice, farro, quinoa, um, kind of barley, all those grains would go, and corn goes up in that section. Corn is no longer a vegetable, just so you know. Um, and then you have your healthy proteins. Beans and fish are first, eggs, then chicken, um, pork, beef, kind of all down the line. Um, but just really kind of just take a moment and think about, and a good first step is when you're planning your meal, what's the first thing, ingredient you think about planning your meal around? Meat, right? So start with the vegetable. Just start by planning your meal around the vegetable, and then that will kind of start to allow you to help bulk up that plate a little bit. Um, another tool that I like, and oh, hydration. Hydration is really important to me. Um, I find that a lot of people confuse their hunger and satiety cues with thirst, and it helps aid with digestion, it helps with fatigue, it helps um, eliminate headaches. Um, I just think it's a wonder, wonder um, nutrient. So then another, um, rather than counting ca calories, I love to use um, a hunger satiety scale. Um, and I can share it. Um, if you find me on Facebook, I can share it on Facebook. I didn't put it up here today. But if you think about um, your hunger on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 is you are so famished that you're about to pass out. And then 10 is like Thanksgiving full after the pie, you just need to lay down. You want to kind of hang out between a three and a six. You don't ever want to let yourself get too hungry so that you aren't then going to overeat. So you kind of, if you are, say, if you were coming here and you didn't feel like bringing your lunch, but you were hungry before you came, say you were at that three, eat something so that by the end of this talk, you're not at a two. On the other end, pay attention. Stop halfway through your meal and get to that six. You want to feel satiated, but you don't want to feel full and distended. Um, and if you can start to kind of pay attention to what those cues are, that's a lot better of a measurement of the energy that you need than this arbitrary calculation. Like that calculation can only take you so far because that's based off of a group, a population, um, many years ago, and it's, it, it's not entirely ac accurate. Um, so that is my plate. So then there's kind of, um, kind of my approach, which I've kind of talked about much of this afternoon. Um, so you really want to take the, the time to determine what you're trying to accomplish and why. Um, so many people come in and just tell me they want to be healthy. And then when I tell them what is, ask them what healthy means, all they say is eat healthier foods. I still don't know what, what that means. So really figure out what it is and then make sure that what you're doing 
is going to match up with the why that you're why you're doing whatever dietary or lifestyle change is that you're doing. So, for example, um, if you are, you know, running on empty, if you're stressed in, you're stressed out, you're only getting six nights of sleep, and you're feeling exhausted, cutting out gluten isn't going to make you magically have energy. So it's just, you know, you hear so much out there, but you need to figure out, like, what does gluten do to people, and is that really the cause and effect, or are there other aspects of your life that you can fix before kind of making these arbitrary dietary changes? Um, I'll say it again. Really just make sure that you don't judge yourself. You know, no hitting, even, even for yourself. You really want to take the pressure off. When you, there's too much pressure put on your dietary change, the mental stress can derail you alone. Um, uh, you know, when you're feeling low about yourself, it's difficult to progress forward to change. And intentional or not, there's often so much pressure put on, you know, the good and bad association with dieting. Um, like, this food is good, or I was being good, or I had a bad day. I try and tell people when I ask them, they come in and they're like, oh, I was really bad today. You weren't. <laughs> like, you're not a bad person because you ate a brownie. And it's really important to, to remember that. Um, and I also, you know, people, I see a lot too, I've, I've been really good today. I've only had 400 calories. The reason to eat is to nourish yourself. To only eat 400 calories so far in breakfast and lunch isn't being good to yourself. It's not nourishing yourself. So really you want to have a substantial amount of food to where you're nourishing yourself um, and supporting yourself to, um, to thrive. Um, everyone's nutritional needs are different. Um, so if you have the high school football star and his mother are not going to eat the same diet. And I see a all, all the time is people are constantly passing out dietary advice. This worked for me, that worked for me. And so people are saying like, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm taking a shot of um, apple cider vinegar every morning because it helped my, my best friend lose 15 pounds. You aren't your best friend. So you can listen to what they're saying, but see what's really right for you. And if it's not right for you, it's not because you're a failure. It's because that's not what your body needs. So, and the other thing is, you know, try not to set yourself up um, for lofty, lofty goals that are going to trigger you to fail automatically. Um, just like you wouldn't go from not running at all to running a marathon. But you do want to kind of get yourself up out of your comfort zone. Like, I don't want to negate that at all. You do need to push yourself a little bit, but set something that's reasonable and obtainable for you so that you are able to succeed, and those small little successes will kind of keep your momentum, build that momentum so you can move forward. Um, then there is dietary change as a practice. So I'm sure if you've ever been to a yoga class, a class a lot, often they talk about you are where you are today with no judgment. So it's just always good to kind of take time to reflect and to not even compare yourself to where you were a year ago. Like a year ago, you might have been able to do a spin class um, twice a day and, um, you know, only eat broccoli all day. And you can't beat yourself up for being the person that you are now in comparison to the person you were then. Um, so just kind of take a moment to see where you are. Focus also on your accomplishments and then kind of reconstitute and move forward with your goals a little bit. Um, and, you know, balance is really key. I love the balance of the plate. If you eat 80 um, good foods 80% of the time, that 20% really isn't going to make as much of an impact as you think that it is. Um, and health is more than just a diet. Um, you really need to make sure that you're nur nurturing all aspects of your health. Um, making sure that you're exercising, you're getting enough sleep, you're reducing and eliminating any stressors in your life, and 
and you're not just focusing on the food and your diet because really those all of those things can impact the way that you eat. Um, so, you know, that, so I think that that's kind of my key point is to really kind of look at the bigger picture um, and progress slowly, but push your boundaries a little bit and reward yourself for the for the accomplishments you have made rather than um, punishing yourself for the things that you felt you should have accomplished. So with that, I will take any questions that anybody has. I have a um, round of applause for Kathleen for joining us today. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will come over to you um, just so we can open up the floor for discussion. I've got a question here. Um, could you talk about some food fads? that, you know, you particularly dislike? <laughs> Food fads? Yeah, you know, when bulletproof coffee and all that. Yeah, so, you know, things that I, I, oh, I really do think that there's oftentimes a place for everything. Um, I, and everyone is a little bit different, you know, but I think... Primarily, if you can eat whole foods first, that's the ultimate way to go. Um, you know, I try to discard supplements, um, like protein powders and things like that, but if that's all that time allows you for, then that's what you're going to have to do for, some, for, for a short amount of time. Um, and I just think it's, you know, important to take note in what it is that you're, if what it is that food is supposed to be doing for you and see if that's actually accomplishing what you intended it to do. And sometimes, like, just that mental aspect, if a bulletproof coffee you feel is making you... I've never had it. It's oh, I, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's just one of those... Yeah, I don't think that it's as big of a miracle. I don't think it's going to cause you to burn fat faster and things like that. You're putting saturated fat into your body um, and... Repl <laughs> you put... It's uh, butter, grass-fed butter in... In coffee, it's, it's, instead of cream, and you you blend it up, and it's supposed to increase um, your metabolism, but really you're add or adding saturated fat into your body, which is um, to an extent not all that healthy, or if you overdo saturated fat. Um, but I think it, I I don't like to say that there's any fad diet that I. There's a place and time for everything. I, sorry. <laughs> We've got a question. Didn't really answer. <laughs> We've got a question over here. Does food affect uh, sleep patterns? And if so, how? And it, what could you do about it? It can affect your, your sleep patterns. I would have to, you know, really t take a look at um, the individual. Um, but excessive carbohydrates can affect your sleep patterns if you are, have any food adversities um, that's causing um, gastrointestinal distress, things like that. Even your gut microbiome, um, so the gut... Um, the bacteria that lives in your gut, if that's off in an, in an imbalance, that can, because they actually talk to your neurotransmitters and your hormones, and that can also affect your sleep. Um, so I would have to take an individualized look um, at a specific dietary patterns to see what may be the cause. Um, but oftentimes I would say, you know, make sure you're getting enough water and limiting caffeine as, as my quick fix. But... We've got, we've got a question back here in the back. Could you tell us about um, Coca-Cola and diet Coca-Cola and the effects that it has on us, please? Uh, and the effects it has on, on what? On us. us? Like okay. <laughs> so um, excess sugar um, can actually... So it can ex so regular Coca Cola can cause a, a sugar spike. So if you have um, an excessive amount of um, refined carbohydrate, which would be the sugar in Coca Cola, you're going to increase the amount of sugar that's released into your bloodstream. That will also increase the amount of insulin that's your in um, put into your bloodstream, and that can cause excessive ushering into the fat cells rather than utilizing that as energy, which can you know 
over repeated amounts of time can lead to increased um, um, insulin resistance and um, uh, elevated cholesterol. Um, theoretically, you know, if the rest of your diet is out of balance. Um, and it can also kind of, with that quick ushering of insulin, it's going to send all of that sugar into your cells to where you'll dip actually kind of below that, that hunger level for some people. So you all, you, you may become like hypoglycemic a little bit and getting that gnawing feeling of hunger when you're not necessarily hungry. Um, and then with the diet soda, you know, there is, that goes back to, um, you are what you eat. So if you're adding artificial sweeteners into your diet, your body doesn't necessarily know what to do with them or know how to process them. Um, and there have been links to autoimmune disease with artificial sweeteners. So that includes, um, you know, arthritis, um, Crohn's disease and, and other things like that, which if you are predisposed for that can turn that um, switch on for you. Any other questions? Good question. <laughs> yeah. It does go by your weight. Um, it goes by your weight, your activity level, how much you sweat, how salty your sweat is. Um, a good rule of thumb um, is you want to drink water consistently throughout the day. And a, a good um, measure is the color of your urine. If it's a watered down um, lemonade color, then it's good. You don't necessarily want it to be clear all the time because that can cause um, an imbalance of electrolytes um, in your body, and you don't want it to be, you know, orange juice color. <laughs> to be sorry for lunch, if anyone's eating lunch. We yeah. Got it. Oh. So, so, you, so the question was asking about salts and the different types of salt and Himalayan sea salt and if they're actually good for you. Um, so, if you have high blood pressure. I would advise you to limit sodium intake. I personally do use like a, a sea salt or a Himalayan sea salt I, and mix it up because there are other um, minerals in there that kind of balance the effect or may balance, I don't want to say definitely balance, but may balance the effect of sodium. So you have like your, um, um, there's potassium in there and other minerals that are beneficial to your body. So I think that it is a little bit helpful, um, more beneficial than your regular table salt. Um, but I would still ca caution to limit it and utilize other herbs and spices because there are fabulous benefits from the different herbs and spices that are out there. And I am going to put a plug in for Ambrosia because I think that they have great spices over there. And Claudia is really knowledgeable in, in the spice spice world. You mentioned earlier apple cider vinegar. What um, benefits does apple cider vinegar have? Um, some people use, use it to alkalize their body a little bit. Um, in the high, this high protein kind of phase that's going on right now, people t can have a lot of acidity in their body, which can cause inflammation and aches and pains. So I believe that that's one of the reasons that people take um, apple cider vinegar in the morning is to alkalize. Um, other people take it as an immu immune beast booster. Um, I'm not, I'm indifferent. I don't take, take shots of apple cider vinegar, but if you like it, go for it. It's not going to hurt you. We've got a question up in the yeah. front. Could you explain set point I think you touched on it, but... I just touched on it. Um, so it's just kind of, just as if you were holding your breath, um, at some point your body's going to trigger you to take large gasps of air. So if, if you start to um, take away too many calories all at once, then your body is going to... Um, trigger you to get maintain your set point. So your your body is at a certain, say you're 150 pounds, and um, you start to drop down, and 
you've lost 15 pounds, your body is going to say, hold up, I've, I, I, we're, we're, going, we're, we're consistently dropping weight and, and your body's going to actually send all these triggers and mechanisms to get you back to that, that set point. So at about 10% is when it starts to kick back in and you'll tend to find a plateau to where your body shifts and adjusts and starts utilizing the, your calories more efficiently so that it doesn't start to lose any more weight. So typically people tend to hold off there. Some people say you cannot change your set point and some people say that you can. I believe that you can change your set point, but it does take a little bit more time. Um, kind of an example is, is once you kind of gained weight, it's a lot more difficult to um, take it off and maintain it in comparison to if you had never gained the weight before because you have now created this new set point for yourself. Um, and it's a lot easier to create the set point higher because your fat cells actually hold a lot of hormones um, and act as a hormone, um, I think, um, dispensary, I, I'm not thinking of the right word. Um, so it will kind of fight against um, your body to kind of hold that higher set point. Does that help a little bit? Do we have any other um, final questions for this afternoon? We got one right here. Yep. Um, how important really is it to buy organic? I know strawberries can be two for four sometimes yeah. at the stop and shop and the other ones are five ninety nine, and you just kind of say, "Really, which one?" Right. I, for the most part, I. There is a if you Google Dirty Dozen, there is a list of the um, foods that are sprayed more heavily and use more um, pesticides and um, fertilizers and things like, like that, berries. like berries. I would say, me personally, I feel more comfortable buying those foods organic um, than the foods that you peel and things like that. Apple or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I, um, I would not worry so much. Um, it really also depends on if it's going to prevent you from eating fruits and berries, if you don't have the budget for it, then eat the conventionally grown strawberries. Um, it's more important to eat fruits and vegetables than to avoid them because they're not organic. Does that answer? Thank you. Well, let's have, um, oh, I have one final question in the back um, and then we'll wrap things up. What are your thoughts on a low carb, high fat diet? Low carb, high fat diet. Um, it's, it might be beneficial. Um, it depends on you. It really, it depends on you. I think that there is, especially if you are not like a, a super athlete, athlete um, you don't have elevated cholesterol, we'd have to look at all sorts of different factors. Um, but um, having protein, higher um, mono and polyunsaturated fats, and lower carbohydrates, but make, making sure that you are, you know, utilizing starchy vegetables, fruits, um, low-fat dairy to kind of keep your energy level up. I think that it can be beneficial for some people. Um, and it can also be beneficial if you have, um, if you're epileptic and other um, diseases like, or ailments like that, that um, therapeutic diet can be helpful. Great, well let's have one um, final round of applause for Kathleen for joining us today and talking to us about nutrition. Um, we will be back next week with Katie Kaiser um, talking about photography, so please do come back next week and thank you all for coming out today. <laughs>